أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله سبحانه وتعالى in ayah number 73 of surah at-tawbah he addresses the holy prophet so up until now brothers and sisters you see that the theme of surah at-tawbah has been how to deal with mushrikeen kuffar and also how to deal with the munafiqeen allah says o prophet strive against the disbelievers and the hypocrites and be firm with them their refuge is hellfire what an evil destination now when the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wa was when he was in mecca his struggle was relatively simple in that his enemies for the most part were easily identifiable that the the struggle in mecca was primarily against the kuffar so the struggle was an external struggle the kuffar tried to strip the muslims of their religious freedoms they persecuted them so it was very clear in mecca who supported the prophet and who was opposed to the holy prophet so this was the situation in mecca now of course there are some exceptions but generally the the struggle in mecca was a struggle against the kuffar who were persecuting the uh, the muslim community when the prophet migrated from mecca to medina the struggle became a bit more complex what happened especially after you know the prophet was victorious in a number of battles when he had established his government when money started to flow in the community you see that there 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 was this there was a new enemy that emerged there was an internal enemy that began to develop so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah he's reminding the prophet that now in medina your struggle is more complicated that you have a struggle against kuffar because the, the prophet was still still dealing with the kuffar but you also have to deal with a much more dangerous enemy an en enemy that is not easily identifiable and that is the internal struggle struggling within the community and you find that as we've seen through the verses that we've covered one of the great dangers that the munafiqeen posed to the muslim community is that they made they were they, there was a relentless attempt to lower the ambitions of the muslim community they were not willing to participate in battles they were always trying to lower the the ambitions of the muslim community and the holy prophet had very high aspirations. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi believed that a mu'min could achieve incomprehensible things. But you see that the munafiqeen are always trying to deflate. They're trying to lower these ambitions. Now, and you see that these munafiqeen are not even interested in being part of the struggle. Whenever they're, whenever times get difficult, they refuse to participate and they try to discourage others from participation. Now, in this ayah, Allah says to the Prophet, Ya ayyuhan Nabi, Jahid al Kuffara wal Munafiqeen, struggle against the Kuffar and the Munafiqeen. Waghlub alayhim and be firm with them. Now, you see, the Prophet ﷺ in this ayah is being told to be firm with the munafiqeen. The Prophet ﷺ never pointed the finger at individuals and say, you're a munafiq, you're a mu'min. That wasn't his way. And the Prophet ﷺ in Medina, he was very lenient with the believers. He was very lenient with the believers. Afan, one second. Laya, can you take her for a second? 
The Prophet ﷺ in Medina, he was lenient with the believers. If someone professed belief, said La ilaha illallah Muhammadan Rasulullah, they would be treated as believers. The Prophet ﷺ wanted to instill this, this virtue in the hearts of his followers that you should always have a good opinion of your fellow believers. You, sh you shouldn't be suspicious of them. If someone greets you, if someone is a Muslim, you shouldn't try to investigate into the, the, the truthfulness of their claim. Now, so the Prophet was lenient with the Mu'mineen and he was also lenient with the Munafiqeen. When they would make excuses, the Prophet ﷺ would accept their excuses. He wasn't harsh with them. He treated them all alike. Even when he knew someone was a Munafiq, the Prophet never exposed them. Because if you can imagine, if the Holy Prophet ﷺ started to expose who the hypocrites were, started to point them out one by one, this would set a very dangerous precedent. What would happen to, to the next generation of Muslims? People would follow this practice, and you, you'll see that people would start to question the iman of others. And the Prophet ﷺ did not want to set that precedent. But rather, the Holy Prophet ﷺ allowed them to expose themselves. So instead of pointing the finger and saying that this is a munafiq, this is a hypocrite, he'll give them orders to do something and their failure to obey would blow their cover. Now, it's interesting that when you look at this verse, Allah says, strive against the kuffar and the munafiqeen. Some of the, some scholars, when they look at this verse, they say the Prophet never conducted jihad against the munafiqeen. If you look at all of the battles, all of the battles were defensive battles or preemptive battles that were waged against the kuffar. So where was the jihad against the munafiqeen? If we understand jihad to mean to take arms. Some of the, some scholars are of the belief that this struggle against the munafiqeen was carried on by the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. That even though the Prophet ﷺ is being addressed to conduct jihad against the kuffar and the munafiqeen, you'll find that because Amir al muminin because Imam al Hassan, because Imam al Hussein are part of the Prophet, they carry that prophetic essence that they are the ones who continue the struggle against the munafiqeen. And that's why we have traditions where the Holy Prophet ﷺ, he tells Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, Satuqatil ala ta'wil kama qataltu ala tanzeel. That, oh Ali, you will fight for the correct interpretation of the Quran in the same way that I fought for the revelation of the Quran, for the Quran to reach the people. So after the death of the Prophet, Ali ibn Abi Talib, who did he go to battle with? Did he go to battle with Ahlul Kitab? Did he go to battle with Kuffar? The, the Imam alayhi salam, when he was the Khalifa, he fought against people who called themselves Muslims. And in fact, many companions after the death of the Prophet, especially like the likes of Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari and others, they would say that we would we would be able to distinguish the believer from the hypocrite through their animosity towards Ali ibn Abi Talib or their love towards Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ya ayyuha nabi jahid al-kuffara wal-munafiqeen waghlub alayhim. Struggle, fight against the disbelievers and the hypocrites. Now the word jihad, of course, as some scholars have observed, the word jihad has many meanings. It doesn't necessarily mean to take up arms. So some scholars have understood that the Prophet took up arms against the disbelievers who fought him, but his jihad against the munafiqeen was different. It was a jihad of persuasion. It was a jihad of firmness. That he used the jihad of his tongue with them. Because the Prophet is essentially being told in this verse that, Ya Rasulullah, 
You are lenient. You are general. You are gentle with the believers. Don't be like that with the munafiqeen. Be firm with them. Do not allow them to take advantage of your politeness. And this is this is also a lesson for people who are in leadership positions that do not compromise your values for the sake of being nice. You know, sometimes you have to be firm. You have to take a firm stand that this policy of leniency should not be granted to the munafiqeen because they are your enemies who are in disguise. So when scholars look at this verse, they say that the word jihad, they speak about the different types of jihad. So one type of jihad, of course, is the military struggle where the Prophet Sallallahu takes up arms and he has to fight in defense of the community. We're familiar with the, the number of battles that he fought. And then you have the, the jihad of the tongue, the jihad of the tongue, to speak the truth, even if, it's, even if it ruffles feathers, even if it offends powerful people. You know, when, when Imam Zain al-Abidin was asked to give, asked the, about the meaning of courage, what does it mean to be courageous? The Imam alayhi salam, Imam Ali ibn Hussein, he says, Courage is kalima tuhaqqin inda sultan in fajr. That courage is to speak the truth in the face of a tyrant, tyrannical people. That you speak haq. This in and of itself is a struggle. And then you have, of course, the, the struggle against the self. You know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا Those who struggle in our way, we will guide them to our path. So Allah says, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّبِي جَاهِدُ الْكُفَّارَ وَالْمُنَافِقِينَ You have a two-fold struggle. You have to struggle against the external enemies in the form of the kuffar, and you also have a struggle against the hypocrites. وَغْلُضْ عَلَيْهِمْ Be firm with them. Do not allow them to exploit your gentleness, your mercy, your kindness. Their final destination is paradise. Even if they succeed in this life, even if they accomplish what they desire in this life, their final abode is something that is very unpleasant. So all of their efforts will end with what? Humiliation and punishment. Now in the next verse, we see that when, when the munafiqeen are caught doing something wrong, and, the, and this goes for you know, people in general, when, when the hypocrites are confronted, what do they usually do? They deny. They deny that they've done anything wrong. But when they're caught red-handed and there's evidence that they, they uh, there's evidence of misconduct, what do they do? They try to minimize it, that it's not a big deal. It's just words. It's not a big deal. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the next ayah, ayah number 74, وَلَقَدْ قَالُوا Allah says, they swear by God that they did not say it, but indeed they spoke the word of disbelief and disbelieved after submitting to God. And they had ambitions that they did not achieve. And they were vengeful only because God and His Messenger enriched them from His bounty. If they repent, it would be better for them. But if they turn away, God will punish them with a painful punishment in this world and in the hereafter and, and in the hereafter and on earth, they shall neither have a protector or helper. Now the ayah begins. They swear by God that they did not say it. Now the question is, what was said? What is this ayah referring to? There are a number of different views, but one, one opinion is that there was 
a munafiq among the Muslim ranks by the name of Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. He was the most famous and the most notorious hypocrite. It is reported that after the battle of Uhud, you know, after the Muslims won the battle of Badr and they were gaining momentum and they, they, they became more established, Abdullah ibn Abi Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Abi Salul, he says that on, on their way back from uh, from Uhud, he says about the Prophet, "Fatten your dog, and he will eat you." It's it's an expression, and essentially what he was saying is that if we return to Medina, that the Prophet is becoming too powerful, that. When we were, and he says that if we return to Medina, the mighty will expel the lowly. That if, if Muhammad becomes too powerful, he will expel us. So Abdullah ibn Ubay starts to suggest that maybe we should get rid of the Prophet. And you find that even when we spoke a few sessions ago, some of the companions, some of the Munafiqeen tried to assassinate the Prophet. They tried to get rid of him. Now, this individual. Abdullah ibn Ubay, he had ambitions because the verse says that وَهَمُّوا بِمَا لَمْ يَنَالُوا that they had ambitions that they did not achieve. Now this particular individual, he's one of the Ansar. So he was a resident of Medina before the Prophet arrived. So he was, he was, he was Yathribi. Abdullah ibn Ubay, was had plans to become the ruler of Medina before the prophet's arrival. So that you know the mushrikeen, you know the, the the people of Medina are living there. He had political ambitions, and he was making arrangements to ascend to rulership to become the ruler of Yathrib. But what happens? The prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi migrates to Medina, establishes his state, and then the Prophet ﷺ becomes the head of state. So Rasulullah's hijrah to Medina thwarted the political ambitions of Abdullah ibn Ubay. And there were others, there are other companions who are mentioned who, who, made, uh, who tried to assassinate the Prophet. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is essentially saying that they they had ambitions that they did not achieve. Abdullah ibn Ubay, for example, wanted to get rid of the Prophet so he could become the ruler of Yathrib. Others, probably for similar reasons, they wanted to get rid of him. He was becoming too powerful and they could not tolerate, they could not stomach the fact that Beni Hashim has now risen to prominence. And there are indications that his successor will be Ali ibn Abi Talib, another person from Bani Hashim. So, word is sent to the Prophet. Rasulullah hears that Abdullah ibn Ubay makes this statement that he mocks the Prophet. He suggests that we should get rid of the Prophet. So, what does he do? As the ayah says, Yahlifuna billahi ma qalu. They swear by God that they didn't say it, they didn't say anything. So, Abdullah ibn Ubay, he denies it. But Allah reveals this ayah saying, وَلَقَدْ قَالُوا كَلِمَةَ الْكُفْرِ Indeed, they, they did utter the word of disbelief. Is there anything that is more heinous? You know, it's one thing to say, I no longer support the Prophet. It's one thing to say that I don't believe that you're a messenger of God. But to plot, to assassinate him, this is, this is the highest level of kuf. That... It's not just words. Allah says, no, the niyyah was really there. It's not just words. وَلَقَدْ قَالُوا كَلِمَةَ الْكُفْءُ وَكَفَرُوا بَعْدِ إِسْلَامِهِمْ That you, you disbelieve. This expression is, is a type of kuf. Some of them may have been sincere when they joined. Allah says, you've, you've nullified your faith by, by uttering such words. It's not just words. You know, there are some things that you can say, oh, you know, I... It's, it's just words. It doesn't mean anything. But when you're talking about killing the prophet, that's not something to be taken lightly. 
So then the niyyah behind this talk was very, uh, you know, expelling the Prophet. What is really meant is that you want to get rid of him. And then Allah says, وَمَا نَقَمُوا إِلَّا أَنْ أَغْنَاهُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ مِنْ فَضْلٍ And they were vengeful only because God and His Messenger enriched them from His bounty. Now you may say that, why are they, why are they so angry with Him? Why do they have so much contempt for the Prophet? So here, you know, Allah is saying that the only crime of Rasulullah is that he enriched them spiritually and materialistically. So this is a, kind of, a way of kind of saying that, you know, he's innocent. He did nothing. That this is how you repay the man who enriched you and took you from being Bedouin Arabs who, who were not taken seriously, that you, are, you have now emerged as a superpower. He gave you a life of dignity. He enriched you spiritually and even materialistically. You you guys are all living comfortably now. Now look at this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if they repent, it would be better for them. This is really a testament to the boundless mercy of Allah. Who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying? Who is he speaking to? Allah is leaving the door of Tawbah open for who? For people who missed Fajr by accident? For people who, you know, maybe, you know, missed paying Khums one year? Allah is offering Tawbah to those who were talking about killing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So that's why, you know, when, when you and I, we make mistakes, we commit sins, we should never say that, no, Allah will never forgive me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is leaving the door of Tawbah open for these types of individuals, that if they were to repent, even after uttering such a, such a statement that we should kill the Prophet, we should get rid of the Prophet, Allah says, if you sincerely repent, I will accept you. I'll accept your forgiveness. But if they don't repent, if they turn away, God will punish them with a painful punishment in this world and the hereafter. So, Allah, so it's as though Allah, you know, some of the munafiqeen, they might be saying that, you know, even if we go and go to hell, at least we're going to enjoy our dunya. At least we'll live comfortably in dunya. Allah says, no. If you continue to abuse the Prophet. If you try to kill the Prophet, I will make sure that you suffer in dunya and in the akhir. And you'll have no protector. No, no one will be able to protect you from this earthly punishment as well as the punishment that will come in the hereafter. So Allah, when he, when he, you know, it's interesting that Allah, when he, when he, when he addresses the munafiqeen, that what was the crime of the Prophet other than God and his messenger enriched you. Allah is reminding them that you need to remember where you came from. You need to remember now that you guys have a bit of power, you forgot your origin. And we have to remind ourselves of who we are. You know, when we, when we become successful, when we start making money, when you start getting that promotion, don't forget where you came from. Don't forget that there were, you know, today you have money in your account, yesterday you had nothing. Today you might be well known. You might be a person of influence, but in the past, no one knew you. So we have to be conscious of, of where we came from, of our humble beginnings. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then in ayah number 75, He says, وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ عَاهَدَ اللَّهِ لَإِنْ آتَانَا مِنْ فَضْلِهِ and among them are those who make a pledge to God, saying, if he gives me from his bounty, we will surely spend in charity, and we will surely be among the righteous. You know, this, this ayah reminds me of, you know, people who ask me, Sheikh, can we play the lottery? And if you say, no, you can't play, you, you can't play the lottery. They say, no, but Sheikh, I swear, wallah, if I win the lottery, I'll pay khums, I'll build schools, I'll build masajid, I'll give 
70% of it, half of it to the fuqara. Allah here is giving us an example of someone like that. Now this ayah was revealed about a man, a companion of the Prophet named Tha'laba ibn Hatib. Now Tha'laba was a companion of the Prophet and he was among the poor companions of Rasulullah. And Tha'laba seemed like a very devout Muslim. He used to, he used to pray jama'ah with the Prophet in the masjid. All, all of the daily prayers, he would offer them in congregation with Rasulullah So imagine, so this is someone who frequents the masjid, prays, be, prays jama'ah behind the Prophet every day. One day, Tha'laba comes to the Prophet He was struggling financially. He was poor. He was destitute. He comes to the Prophet and he says, Ya Rasulullah, pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Ask Allah, make dua that Allah grants me a great amount of wealth. I'm tired of this life of poverty. It's taken a toll on me. Rasulullah was reluctant. You know, there's some people, they complain about not having anything, but it's actually better that they don't have. Because if Allah were to give them, they won't know how to handle His blessings. It will make them heedless. So the Prophet tells him, Ya Thalab, shukra khayrun min kathiran la tutiqa. O Thalab, having a little bit and being grateful for it is better than having a lot and being ungrateful. Because many people whom Allah has blessed with wealth, with health, with children, many of them, they're ungrateful. They're ungrateful for what Allah has given them. They complain. They're never happy. So Rasulullah says it's better to have a little bit and be grateful than to be granted a lot and then you become among those who are ungrateful. But Thalib insisted. He pressured the Prophet. He says, Ya Rasulullah, please, I promise that if Allah grants me wealth, as the ayah says, I will give in charity. I will be so generous. I'll be very generous. So the Prophet ﷺ, he raises his hands in dua. Allahumma rzuq Tha'laba malam. Oh Allah, grant Tha'laba wealth. Now the, the dua of the Prophet is mustajab. There's no hijab, there's no veil that would prevent the dua of the Prophet from being answered. So there are different reports as to how Tha'laba became wealthy. Some say that his cousin passed away and he was the only relative. So he inherited this great amount of wealth from his relative who passed away. Others say that he had some cattle and they started to, to procreate and multiply. In any case, Tha'laba becomes wealthy. So slowly he starts to build this wealth. Now, as I mentioned, Tha'laba was coming to the masjid every day, praying behind the Prophet, all of the prayers. Suddenly, he stops showing up for Fajr. Because, you know, he works a lot now. He has a lot of money to manage. And then after some time, he stops coming for Dhuhr and Asr. So he only goes to the masjid to pray with the Prophet, Maghrib and Isha. But he would go every day. And then as his wealth multiplied and he started to make even more, he started to come to the masjid, you know, once every few days. And then it became once a week, only on Jumu'ah he would go. And mind you, he lived very close to the, to the masjid. And then he stops showing up. He stops showing up. At the end of the year, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, you know, zakat, was legislated, right? So zakat is legislated and the Prophet, he, as, as we mentioned in this verse, Allah commands the Prophet to take sadaqat from the people. So zakat goes from being an individual practice to being something that's collected by the state. So the Prophet sends his functionaries to collect zakat. And because, you know, Tha'laba, 
you know, is lives on a farm and he has all of these cows. He has a lot of things that are that you have to pay zakat on. So the tax collector comes to pay to collect zakat from Thalib. So Thalib goes from being a recipient of of zakat of charity. Now he has to pay Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 76. Allah says what happens? But when he gave them, when he, but when he gave from his bounty, they were stingy. They were stingy with it and turned away while they refused. So the tax collector comes to Thalib and says, you have to, you have to pay zakat. Thalib says that, why do I have to pay zakat? That why, why, why are you taking money from me? This is like jizya. What's the difference between a Muslim and a non-Muslim? You take taxes from non-Muslims. Isn't that enough? So he started to say that this zakat is like jizya. I don't want to pay it. That what's the point of being Muslim if we also have to pay taxes? And so, subhanAllah, this, you know, this story of Thalaba, it reminds me of a lot of people who refuse to pay khums. He has all of this wealth. He doesn't want to pay a small amount of zakat. You know, when we speak about khums, you know, say you pay, you make $50,000 a year and your expenses are 45 and then you have 5,000 left over. Allah, Allah says, keep the 45. I don't want it. It's all from him. Allah says, keep the 45. The, even the five you have left, I don't want it. Just give me one thousand from the five thousand that you have left. That's it. But we still, it's all from Allah. It doesn't, none of it belongs to us. That's why Allah in this eye, he says that when we gave him from our bounty, from his bounty, this is all from Allah's fault. So whether it's zakat or khums, people become stingy. They don't want to give. They think it belongs to them. Allah says, you keep all of it, even what you have remaining. I only want a small portion of it. And in the akhir, and I will, I will, I will bless your wealth in dunya. What you give in khums and zakat, I will return it to you multiple fold. And in the akhir, I'll reward you for it. But yet we still, we still refuse. So he refuses. He refuses to pay zakat. The tax collector goes back to the prophet. And when the prophet hears this, he says, Ya thalab, Ya thalab. That curse be upon Thalab. Is it worth it, brothers and sisters, that Allah gives you all of this wealth, but you receive a la'na from, from the Prophet? Is it worth it? You've lost everything. Is it worth it that we collect all of this money and we don't pay our religious dues? And Imam Sahib al Asr al Zaman says to us, Wayh, that woe be unto you, that you've taken my haq. Does our money have any barakah? You know, people, you know, it surprises me. You know, sometimes you meet with certain families. They don't pay their zakat. They don't pay their religious dues. And they wonder why their children do not come out to be righteous. How come I, I pray, I fast? Because part of the money that's in your account, part of the money you feed them is money that belongs to the imam, that you've usurped from the imam. And you're feeding your children with this money. Why is there no barakah in our wealth? This is why. Because you're not paying your religious dues. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 77, So he put as a consequence. So what's the consequence of breaking your promise? What's the consequence of withholding the religious dues? What does Allah say? He put as a consequence hypocrisy in their hearts. Nifaq. Until the day they will meet him. Because they failed in what they have promised him. And for having lied. So breaking the promise, lying not paying your religious dues, ignoring the rights of the fuqara, because that's essentially what you're doing when you withhold your religious dues. That you will meet Allah 
with a heart that is diseased, with a heart that is not filled with nul, it's filled with nifaq, with hypocrisy. The condition of your heart when you meet Allah is very important, brothers and sisters. This is why Ibrahim in the Quran, what does he say? He says, Wala tu, he addresses Allah, Wala tukhzini yawma Oh Allah, do not humiliate me on the day of resurrection. Yawma la yanfa'u malu wa la binun, a day in which neither wealth nor children will be of any avail. Illa man ata Allah bi qalbin salim. Except the one, the only person who's truly going to be safe and secured and prosperous is someone who has qalb salim, a sound heart, a heart that is pure, a, part, a heart that is devoid of these spiritual diseases. So speaking the truth is, is an important virtue that we have to develop. You know, the Prophet when people would ask him for advice, especially young people, they want advice from the Prophet. Rasulullah says, don't lie, don't ever lie. They would say, okay, is there anything else? Don't lie, don't lie, be truthful. When, when a man comes to Imam Zain al-Abideen and he asks the Imam, Ya ibn Rasulullah, akhbirni bi jami'i shara'i al-deen. O oh, Imam, Ya ibn Rasulullah, O oh, grandson of the Prophet, explain to me the Islamic code of conduct. Summarize Islam for me. I want Islam in a nutshell. What should we do? Now, if, if someone asked you, summarize Islam, how would we summarize it? We'd probably say, you know, Islam is to pray five times a day, believe in one God, so on. But look at how the Imam, how the Imam answers. All of the shara'ah boil down to the following. The Imam says, Qawlul Haqq. First thing Imam, Z Imam Zayn al-Abideen says when the man asks him, summarize Islam, is to speak the truth. Speak the, always speak the truth. وَالْحُكْمُ بِالْعَدْلِ And judge fairly. Even when you're dealing with enemies, people you don't like, be fair. Just because you dislike someone, just because you, you have animosity towards someone, that doesn't give you license to oppress them. Be just. And what else? Fulfill your promises. Especially when you're talking to children. Because it shatters them. Fulfill your promises. You find out that the Prophet when he speaks about the munafiq, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from, from nifaq. You know, brothers and sisters, you know, when you get into the habit of lying, you lie about things that relate to your dunya, eventually you're, you'll start to lie about your faith. Don't allow lying to be part, to be any part of your conduct. In fact, lying is so dangerous that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he could have become the Khalifa after Umar if he lied. And if there was anyone who could have justified lying, it would have been Ali ibn Abi Talib. He would have said that I, I, it's a white lie and I, I assume my God-given right and Islam will be protected and Islam will be preserved. When Abdullah, when Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, when they had the shura that Umar established, you know, there were six members. Umar said, you six companions of the Prophet, you vote amongst, amongst yourself who is to be the Khalifa after me. The votes were split. Abdul Rahman, if the votes were split, Umar said, Abdul Rahman decides. The votes were split between Uthman and Ali ibn Abi Talib. Abdul Rahman makes an offer to Ali. He says, oh Ali, you, I, grant, I, I give you the Khilafah under the following conditions. That you rule according to the Quran. Yes, he agrees. That you will rule according to the Sunnah of the Prophet The Imam says, yes. Will you also follow Sirat al shaykhain will you also follow the way of Abu Bakr and Umar? At that moment, if Ali ibn Abi Talib said yes, he would have been the third Khalifa. 
But what does the Imam do? He says, no. He refuses to lie. Because if Imam Amir al muminin had lied, if he were to say yes, the entire our entire aqidah would be shattered. You know why? Because if I if he said I will follow the way of a shaykhain, he would have given legitimacy to them. Meaning what Fatima to Zahra did by concealing her grave would have been undone. He refused to give them, so he refused to lie. And, and, and another question that some of our ulama raise, they say that if Abu Bakr and Umar were following the sunnah of the Prophet, why did you add that as the third condition? If Abu Bakr were and Umar were following the sunnah of the Prophet, there should be only two conditions, follow the Quran and the sunnah, and that's it. The fact that you had to say, are you also going to follow the way of the first khalifa and the second khalifa means what? They did something that went against the sunnah, especially when it came to distribution of what was in Baytul Ma. But the point here is what? Ali ibn Abi Talib, he could have had the khilafah, a kingdom that covers 50 countries on today's map, if he lied. But Ali doesn't sell his deen for the dunya, even if it's for a small one. He doesn't do that. But you and I, we lie for, for things that are much less trivial, much more trivial. We lie for, over things that are much more trivial. And then in the final verse, so, so, so the hadith from the Prophet where he speaks about the qualities of the munafiq, he says, Al-munafiq, man idha wa'ada af akhlaf. That the hypocrite is the one who, when he makes a, makes a promise, he lies. And whenever he does anything, he has to make it public, meaning he's he shows off. There's no no ikhlas. He doesn't do things for the sake of God. He needs to publicize what he does. And when he speaks, he lies. And when when he's entrusted, he betrays. And when they are given rizq, they become heedless when allah gives them rizq they become heedless they're not concerned about the hukuk, the rights that are upon them and when he is deprived he uses trickery to achieve what he wants now at the end of the ayah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about lying yakdibun. now why do people lie to conceal the truth you know, that, that's why people lie. People lie because lying is to conceal the truth. They think they're going to gain something. They're, high, they're concealing the truth from people, from the Prophet, from the believers. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds them that you might be able to conceal the truth from people, but you cannot conceal the truth from Allah. Why? Ayah number 78. Do they not know that God knows the secrets? Some of the commentators of the Quran, they say here, secrets, it means your thoughts. Allah knows your thoughts. You want to lie to conceal the truth? Allah knows the thoughts that cross your mind. And He knows your private conversations. The word najwa means whisper. And look at the contrast between the whispering of a mu'min and the whispering of a munafiq. The private discourse of mu'mineen is what? Worship. That's why Imam Zain al-Abideen gives us what? The 15 whispered prayers. When the whispering, the private discourse of a believer is worship, whereas the private discourse of a munafiq is what? Mockery plotting to hurt the prophet and the believers and the community so you see an interesting contrast there allah knows the unseen we ask allah azza wa jal to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of muhammad wa ali muhammad we'll conclude here and inshallah we'll continue our discussion next week we have any questions or comments inshallah we can take them 
Uh, so so she, uh, how, how does the Imam Ali's refusal to lie during the shura relate to the concept of taqiyah? Things like that sounds like it's something that could fall under that. So, so just as I mentioned, because that, that's a good question. One, one could say that, you know, the Imam alayhi salam, because there was a danger, right? Because you're allowed to lie if, if there's a danger upon yourself, right? So if my life is in danger and someone tells me, just like with, with the, the story of Ammar ibn Yasir, when, when he was captured by the, uh, the Mushrikeen of Mecca, you know, he lied, right? He, he, he renounced his faith verbally. But his heart, of course, was full of iman. Now the problem here is you're not allowed to do taqiyya if doing taqiyya is going to cause damage to Islam. Now you may say, how, 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 how is it going to cause damage to Islam if Ali ibn Abi Talib lies and then becomes the Khalifa? As I said, if Amir al-Mu'mineen were to say, yes, I will follow the policies of Abu Bakr and Umar, that statement right there would have destroyed the pure Islam of Ahlul Bayt. He would, he would have given legitimacy to the enemies. So it was actually for the protection of Islam that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam refused. Now, of course, from a worldly perspective, he lost out on the Khilaf, but, uh, but he preserved the, uh, the purity of Islam by not giving any legitimacy to the tyrants that rose after the, the death of the Prophet. He would, have, he would have been doing the opposite of what Fatima to Zara did. So the Imam salam understood that, and, uh, and therefore that, that would have never uh, uh, qualified to be a moment where he could have just lied for, for a greater good. In fact, there was no greater good. Only if you look at it from a worldly perspective, yeah, that he could have lied and he could have become the most powerful person in uh, in Arabia. He could have been, you know, the Khalifa. That's if you're looking at it through the through a materialistic lens. But no, the, that his refusal to follow the uh, the way of the, the the his predecessors is is a very powerful statement. He delegitimized them with that with those words. Thank you. Also, um, what you had um, said about how the Manafakin would try to reduce the like would try to re reduce the ambitions of the Muslim community, it kind of reminded me about how just generally speaking in our community, oftentimes it's uh, high, high ambitions are looked down upon, and there's generally a, a movement kind of like against that, thinking that hey, if you're ambitious, trying to succeed a lot, then that's not a good thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's very telling that, you know, because again, you know, when, when Allah speaks about munafiqin, you know, Allah's not just sharing history with us. You know, there are hypocrites in, in our communities. There are hypocrites who, there are individuals in our communities who exhibit these these same qualities. So we, we have to kind of be cognizant of the fact that we have to, we have to identify, you know, who are the people who are, you know, uh, decrease uh, limiting the ambitions of the community and, and how do we manage them you know how do we kind of you know reduce their influence and and move the community uh move the community forward it's i mean it, it's a challenge but i mean I, I see this you know everywhere i go that whenever there is a project that will bring a lot of khayr shaitan starts to whisper into the hearts and then you know people start to say oh you know and, and this is why you know in many communities you know they have they have a center, but they don't have, for example, a resident scholar. And if you if anyone in the community proposes that you know we should get a re resident scholar because having a mosque without a uh, without an imam is like having a, a hospital without a doctor. And then what do people do? They say, oh no no, we're we're too small. We don't need it. You know how are we going to afford it? I, you know it's 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 not worth it. We'll, we'll just watch you know YouTube lectures. They want to. They want to, you know, reduce the ambitions of the community. Let's start uh, a food drive. Again, they, they want to keep things at the very bare minimum. And the Prophet and the, the, the Mu'mineen, you know, they, they always wanted to advance, progress. So one of the, the distinguishing qualities of Munafiqeen is that they don't, uh, 
they're always trying to point out problems, but they never want to provide solutions because they're not interested in solutions. They're interested in stagnation. You know, they're, they don't, they don't want to be a part of the effort. They don't want others to get credit and therefore they just handicap everybody. And I, and I, and you know, from my personal experience, I would say that one of the biggest issues in our community is that people refuse to give up credits. Everybody wants credits. Every organization wants their logo. And, and, and this is why we don't, you know, if you stop caring about who gets the credit, you will move very far. And this goes for speakers, scholars, you know, can you, you know, organizations. The moment you stop caring about who gets the credit and you start caring more about getting the work done, this is when we'll go very far. But, uh, yeah, I mean, when I mean, you know, they don't want others to succeed. They didn't want the profit to succeed. You know, they wanted everyone to fail because when they see everyone fail, that's that's their success. Their success is seeing projects fail, seeing organizations collapse. So it's a, it's a very sick mentality, but it's 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 alive even today in our community. Inshallah, we can come up with tactics and strategies to work around this and go above it. Salaam alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum salam. Sheikh, uh, you mentioned about the grave of uh, Lady Fatima, salam alayhi alayha. No. Um, we believe that her grave is concealed, it's hidden. Yes. And uh, none of us know where she is buried. But in the eulogies and in the musibah, the Masaib of uh, Karbala, we hear and we read that on the night of 28th of Rajab, when Imam Hussain al was uh, uh, about to leave Medina early morning, the entire night he was very restless and sometimes he would go to his grandfather's um, grave mm -hmm. and cry and hug the grave and then sometimes he would go to his mother's grave and hug his mother's grave and cry that is one thing and the second is when uh, uh, the ladies and the children uh, after the massacre of karbala um, when they returned to Medina, we read in the books that uh, Zainab Salamullahi Alaiha and uh, the other ladies, uh, they went to the grave of Sayyida Fatima Salamullahi Alaiha and uh, Zainab uh, hugged the grave and she complained about the Ummah and their atrocities on them. So what do you say about it? I'm very sorry if it's a very long question. No, not at all, not at all. Now, when we say that the, the grave of Lady Fatima to Zahra is concealed, that means that the general public, the Muslims, even the Shias, to a certain extent, are not aware of its location. Now, this doesn't mean that, you know, the family of the Prophet and those who are very close to the family of the Prophet don't know where, uh, where she's buried. So it's very, very likely that, you know, Sayyidah Zainab obviously knows where her mother is buried. You know the descendants of the Ahlul Bayt, the very, very trusted, you know, uh, companions and follow disciples of the Ahlul Bayt. Presumably, they they, uh, they knew, and I, I would imagine that when our imams would go and visit her grave, they would it would be a, it would it would be very discreet, and uh, they would make sure that they weren't being uh, watched, or they would go to a number of places to so you know to, to basically confuse anyone who was monitoring them but uh the ahlul bayt salam, the imams of course and, and the close confidence of the imams i have no doubt that uh that they knew the location of the grave so the concealment of her grave is is basically for the people you know we don't know where she's buried the muslims don't know where she's buried but the family of the prophet and those who they chose to disclose uh those whom they chose to share that knowledge with you know they uh they would reveal that uh, information uh to them you know fr from my discussion with with scholars you know so there's a there's a debate about you know whether she's buried 
in Rawlat al Jannah, you know, between the, the Prophet's mimbar and his grave, or she's buried in Jannah al Baqi. I, I've spoken to many scholars, and it seems that many scholars, I mean, no one can say definitively, but it seems that they're more inclined to say that she was she's buried in Baqir. But Allah knows best. Allah knows best, you know, where uh, where her grave is. But inshallah, when the, the Imam of our time reappears, he will guide us towards her grave. And inshallah, they will, will, we pray to Allah that there will be a day where there is a shining gold dome over the grave of Fatima to Zahra. You know, a day when when the haq, the, the right of Ahlul Bayt has been returned to them. And uh, we ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to give us the tawfiq to witness that day. Um, one uh, follow-up question someone asked, uh, is there any solution if we understand our entire group to be hypocrites? And in that case, what is the best movement? If all of them are, are munafiqeen, no, no, number one, we should, we should be very careful, you know, about just saying that, okay, this person is munafiq and that's it, they're, they're done. You know, sometimes believers may exhibit a quality here and there that, that is a quality that is very deeply really rooted in the heart of a munafiq, but that doesn't mean that a person is automatically munafiq and they're doomed. You know, I think that, you know, because even, the, even Allah doesn't tell the Prophet to lose hope with the munafiqeen because the, the prophet never exposes them the prophet his jihad with them is you got to be firm right so when you're dealing with people who want to you know bring down the ambitions of the community you know you have to be firm be like you know this is what we're doing you know you obviously you're consultative but this is what you're doing you want to participate great if not we're going to find other people to 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 move this forward so connecting yourself to like-minded people even if they're not in your locality, just to kind of build that momentum. You know, munafiqeen are always going to try to, you know, hold you down, hold you back. But uh, connecting with like-minded people who want more than the bare minimum is, is, is important. And, uh, but it's, it's important that we, you, don't, you don't just isolate people who exhibit these qualities. And hopefully you pray for their hidayah, but you're firm with them. That, you know, sometimes, you know, you have to uh, you have to put uh, put your foot down when you really feel that these are and the and the only way to do it is that you you have to rally around a pious person of uh, of influence you know I mean, so I mean the mu'minin were strong you know when they had the prophet the mu'minin were strong when they have you know the imams we will be strong if we if we rally around uh, the pious godly maraj our ulama. You know, be connected to them. You know, ask them for guidance and direction, and 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 move forward. And then people who want to hold hold things back, you know, if they don't want to participate, that's fine. But don't allow, don't let their uh, you know their pessimism hold you back. And of course, it's easier said than done. I mean, you know, this is something that's you know we work on generation after generation. But uh, I'm I'm optimistic that things uh, things will slowly change, especially now that we live. At a time where you know I'm I'm sitting here in Vancouver and I, I'm connecting with you guys. I mean, in another time this would have been impossible. So the fact that we can connect to so many people around the world, bring like-minded people together, you know, pull in all of our resources and our skills to uh, to offer something that will kind of raise the Islamic literacy rate, if I want to use that expression, to kind of do something that has some uh, some value. And that, I mean, that's that's really what it comes down to. Uh, she, this question is not related to today's topic. Uh, the just uh, this thought just crossed my mind. No. Um, Muhammad bin Hanafiya, the son of uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Yes. Why is he referred as uh, Muhammad bin Hanafiya instead of Muhammad bin Ali ibn Abi Talib? It's it's with reference to uh to his mother. Now I'm I'm not sure. I would have to. I remember researching this a while a while back, and I, I don't remember exactly why he's called uh, Al Hanafiya. But I believe it has something to do with uh, with uh, with his mother. Now why isn't he called you know you know Muhammad uh, Ibn Ali? 
I off the top of my head, I don't I don't really remember. Thank you. Thank you very much. But, it, but it's good that you're giving me homework now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Allah bless you, give you a very, very long life, keep you protected for Zainab and Naya and for the community. Inshallah. And, inshallah you be um, under the guidance and safety of Imam Sahib al-Zaman, Ajjalallahu ta'ala, Farajah al-Sharif.